Before I enter the next level, I would like to take a quick breather and approach a topic that I would be unable to actually properly commentate if I was playing the game. And slapping post-commentary over me playing the level is definitely not the solution either because then I feel like I'm doing the level itself a disservice and I want to be showing these levels off and reacting to them. So between, the le between levels is definitely the proper place for this. Last episode, I highlighted Yasuhiro Noguchi, who has composed the music for this game, as well as Soul Calibur, Tekken 3, Tekken 4, and Sonic Generations. And this time, I would like to call your attention to another name on the dev team. That name is Vince Jolie, the lead art designer for the game. Vince Jolie has also worked on some very prominent titles. In fact, I recognized his name when I saw him credited. He has worked on... Metroid Prime 2, Metroid Prime 3, Donkey Kong Country Returns, Mario Kart 7, and Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze, among many others. He has worked as an animator, animation lead, or art director for these games, or creative director in the case of Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. And I found his website and found that Pac-Man, Pac-Man World 2, is mentioned. He gives a brief synopsis of his work on the game, uh, as well as some screenshots of Blinky's Frog, which he is responsible for. And I thought, wow, okay, I have something to, to talk about in, in the third episode. But I wanted a bit more. So I decided to reach out to Vince. And as of this recording, <laughs> he and I have been in a conversation uh, spanning about a week and a half. Not only did I get the opportunity to express to one of the lead developers of the game uh, how much this meant to me as both a piece of gaming history and also a part of my childhood, but I got the opportunity to pick his brain a little bit. And so today I'm very surprised and ecstatic to bring you a, a Q&A of sorts. I asked him a few questions about his work on the game and I'm able to share those here. So uh, let's get let's get on that. So first, I asked him if he could go into a bit more detail as to just just exactly what he was responsible for creating in Pac-Man World 2. Like I said, he does give a brief synopsis on his website, but I wanted some more specifics since that was a summary, and he, he certainly worked on other things. So his response was this. I created all the artwork for Pac Village and did the scripting for it. I did receive some help from design and engineering for parts of it. The levels I designed and created were Cannon Chaos, Packed Up Pond, and Blinky's Frog. The bare basics was my art, but a designer made the level. He also says on his website that he played a large role in creating the story and the storyboards for the game. He created 100% of Pac-Man's animations, model, and rig, and did concept art for and modeled several characters. Also on his website is one of the actual storyboards he made for the game, but I'm not going to show it because it's a storyboard for the end of the game, and while I'm not emphasizing the story too much, I would like to save the end of the game for, well, the end of the game. I then asked him about Pack Village in particular, saying, The design of Pack Village is rather unique. It's essentially a tutorial or playground level that doubles as a hub for the bonus content of the game. The fact that you can leave it immediately always stood out to me as a very masterful way of allowing experienced players to skip the tutorial. I guess my question is this. In the levels that you designed, what emotional response did you wish to evoke in the player? In other words, what did you aim for when you made these levels? I'm glad you liked the feel of it. It really was intended to blend or hide the tutorial in a usable space. It feels like home while you learn the controls. The intended feeling for the space, including the other spaces, was to make a place that felt inviting and fun to explore through a solid player package mixed with interesting items and platform challenges. In short, these first levels were intended to be rewarding with many items, being fairly safe to play to get the player comfortable with the controls. And I can definitely see that. I, I wanted to save this topic for this episode because I knew that there was such a stark contrast between the end of the first world and the beginning of the second. The difficulty takes a dramatic spike upward, and I wanted to be able to show that off when talking about Vince Jolie's work to show just how good of a tutorial world the first world is. It's night and day, honestly. 
And it's because of that. It's because it's supposed to be a tutorial world. And it does a fantastic job at getting people used to the gravity of the game, to uh, be able to platform well. It doesn't necessarily pull its punches, but it gives you very few punches to work with, and they're very isolated. You don't have to deal with enemies and bottomless pits until the very end of the world. You tackle challenges in a one-at-a-time one manner. I especially like the, the aesthetic of the two worlds. You never feel like you're necessarily robbed of a good quote-unquote grass world, because the very next world is essentially the first world, but difficult. It's the same sort of locale. You're not getting hills, but you're still getting that timberland, uh, mild region that is just upped in difficulty. Now, this was my last uh, question, but it wasn't his last answer, and I'll explain that in a minute. I asked him, finally, what was your takeaway from this game? Did any of your work in Metroid Prime 2 or 3, or any other project for that matter, pull inspiration from Pac-Man World 2? As far as what influences this game had made for me in subsequent titles, I would say that it played a role in some of the decisions I made for the Donkey Kong games that I worked on, but not really for the Metroid games since I was focused strictly on animation for them. Which, if you remember last episode, I, I made a point about how much this feels like Donkey Kong. And while he didn't work on Donkey Kong Country Returns until almost a decade after his, he worked on this game, I can see in sort of a backward fashion, since he was the art director for Returns, how I would make this connection. In a weird way, these games strike the same chord with me. He concluded by saying that this was a fun game to work on, fairly small team with very talented folks, and to that I wholeheartedly agree. However, this was not my last correspondence with Vince, and in fact, as of this recording, our conversation is still going. After I released the very first episode of the series, uh, he responded to my complaints about the camera controls, saying, you're right about the camera. Our camera engineer was banging his head on the wall trying to get it to work well for so many corner cases, which <laughs> I found funny considering that corners is what the camera typically struggles with, but I'm sure that pun was not intended. In all fairness to him, many of our levels weren't built to be very camera friendly. And also in fairness, and I didn't, I didn't give my complaint full, full credence, uh, because through the concept of a 3D camera had only existed for six years, actually under six years, if you consider that uh, Super Mario 64 debuted this system, it came in out in 96, this game was released in 2002, and it most shortly began development in 2001 or earlier, so five or six years, that's not nearly enough time to, to perfect such a, a new and revolutionary system as this. So, to be completely fair, while it is a flaw of the game, I don't hold it against the game, if that makes sense. Once again, I want to extend a big thank you to Vince for making this Let's Play something special. His contribution and this Q&A steered the Let's Play in a direction that I wouldn't have taken it otherwise, and I, I am I'm so thankful for the result, and so thank you Vince for making this Let's Play special.